Thank you, everybody. I'm going to talk today about the uh, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribe, uh, which I'll refer to as CSKT tribes, uh, compact with the state of Montana, um, to which the US government is also party. Um, this compact kind of evolved over the course of a couple of a few decades and actually just started to be implemented this year. So we'll, we'll talk about how they got there. Um, just to start, this is Montana. Um, these are the various water basins in the state of Montana. This little area on the corner here is the Flathead Reservation. So it's actually a fairly large chunk of land. The, the water rights that we're talking about today uh, really cover the entire region of Northwest Montana, uh, mostly west of the Continental Divide, but there are some rights that were affected by the treaty that actually on the, on the east side of the Continental Divide. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the history, uh, the, the kind of way that these water rights came about, the, some of the context of the negotiations, talk a little bit about the negotiation topics and then where they ended up. Um, and even as I go through the history, I hope to explain, because some of the disputed rights, kind of a lot of the questions go back to the origins of those rights. I hope to kind of bring up some of the different disputes in the historical context so that, and, and also kind of begin to shed light on kind of the present status of them and, and, and how they came up with the negotiations based on that context. So to quickly look a little bit at the history, the Treaty of Hellgate, which is the treaty that created the Flathead Reservation in Northwest Montana, it's about a million and a quarter acres, was signed on 18, in 1855 by representatives of the U.S. as well as the tribes that, that were party to the treaty. The treaty gave them, gave them the rights to that land, um, but it also included uh, an unusual um, line, which has become very important, um, that was not included in any of the other treaties that the U.S. government negotiated with the state of Montana. This line is from Article 3, the exclusive right of taking fish in all the streams running through or bordering said reservation is further secured to said Indians, as also the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed places in common with citizens of the territory. So this provision maintained that the tribes had the rights to use water that passed through some of the lands that they conceded, uh, that the part that says, um, the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed places. This is the basis of what have become to be known as the tribes off reservation water rights. And we'll talk about what those are and, and how those became contentious. As was often the case with treaties of native tribes, the US government you know, violated the spirit and the letter of the Hellgate Treaty within a number of decades. The kind of general history that pertains to a lot of the, you know, all the Native American tribes is in 1887, the Dawes Act was passed, which subdivided native reservations into individual allotments and open reservations to settlements by whites. Uh, in particular, the Flathead Reservation, this kind of accelerated after the Flathead Allotment Act of 1904, uh, provided for the distribution and irrigation of actually slightly, you know, actually a few different sizes of allotments, but predominantly 160 acre allotments to Indian households. Uh, and then the rest of those, of the acres that weren't given out um, were considered surplus. Um, and those surplus acres were available to, to non-tribal members. And so today, actually, most Flathead Reservation residents are not tribal members. Uh, and there are many pu both public and private non-tribal water uses, including municipal uses. For example, uh, Polson, Montana, which is the, the county seat of Lake County, which is one of four counties in the, that um, enters into the Flathead Reservation. Um, Polson, Montana is the seat county of Lake Montana, and it's the largest town on the Flathead Reservation. So I think it's just important to, to recognize the complexity of the, the land use. The Flathead Indian Irrigation Project was uh, a federally funded uh, irrigation system that was developed over the course of the first uh, half century, mostly in the, in the 20s and 30s. And it's really a really extensive network of, of irrigable acres, canals, laterals, distribution systems, pumping stations, storage reservoirs that provides irrigation to all of the land that was described on the, la on the past slide, both native uses, native users, and uh, municipal and non-native users, particularly agricultural users on the reservation who are not uh, members of the tribe. So that's uh, what you need to know about that. Oh yeah, and it's in important to note that CSKT operates uh, a large portion of FIIP, of the Flathead Indian Irrigation Project, um, it has since the 80s. So water rights. Like many Western states, Montana adopted a first-in-time, first-in-right doctrine of prior appropriation. Um, 
And until 1973, most rights in the state were use rights, uh, which means they were exercised when someone basically took water for a beneficial use. Most of the time, they never filed those rights with the county or the state. And so many rights had no paper record. You know, rights often spanned multiple counties, and, there were com and they'd be competing claims to the same quantity of water. I mean, this became increasingly complex because rights were also kept in county courthouses. And so even if a right was filed, you had to go to every county courthouse to figure out um, you know, if there were competing rights. So in 1972, when Montana adopted a new state constitution recognizing existing water rights, it also called upon the state legislature to, quote, establish a system of centralized records for water rights. And that's the origin of the dispute, is uh, the status of the Indian rights in the centralized record. In 1973, uh, the water, Montana passed the Water Use Act, um, which mandated that the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation permit new claims and manage a record of water rights. Um, and it established a system of adjudicating pre-1973 claims. And this means that all new claims had to be filed with the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. Um, and it began to create a bureaucratic structure for looking at all claims filed prior or existing even if they weren't filed prior to 1973. In 79, uh, the Senate Bill 76 established the Montana Water Court, which was set up uh, initially on a 15 year term limit, although it's still around now 50 years later and they're hoping to have uh, all their work done. I believe the recent, most recent estimate I saw was by 2028, but even that is you know, questionable. Um, and established the Water Court to adjudicate all pre-1973 claims. Uh, however, while this legislation was under consideration, both the U.S. Department of the Interior and the tribes expressed opposition um, to having their water rights adjudicated by a state court because they argued that uh, these water rights, the, both the uh, federal water rights pertaining to federal lands, whether they're national parks or Bureau of Land Management lands, and also the, uh, the native water rights, uh, which were held in trust by the U.S. government, uh, say that they argued that they were not subject to state courts. Um, and many in Montana's agricultural community also oppose the use of water courts to determine native rights because ranchers and others both on the reservation and off the reservation feared that extensive tribal claims uh, would supersede their historical rights because of the first in time uh, doctrine. Um, in response, uh, the legislator amended the draft legislation and established the Montana Reserved Water Rights Compact Commission, which negotiates on the state's behalf. Um, the commission was also initially authorized for a limited term, but uh, that term has been, was extended and extended and extended. And we'll talk about where it ended up. Uh, there are just quickly, there are two kinds of tribal rights that pertain. There are federally reserved rights that were uh, set aside by the federal government for use by the native tribe. Um, and these have a priority date that's equivalent to the date of the reservation's creation. Uh, so in, in the Flathead Reservation, 1855, and they're governed by what's called the Winters Doctrine. Um, which refers to the Supreme Court doctrine that said that when the U.S. set aside land for an Indian reservation, it implicitly reserved adequate water for the tribes to fulfill their livelihoods. And so this is the on-reservation rights that we're talking about that are federally reserved. The Aboriginal rights are rights that predate a reservation um, and are explicitly recognized in the treaty or statute that create the reservation. And these rights have a different priority date of time immemorial. And Time immemorial means, I thought that was an interesting term, you know, time extend, what it means is time extended beyond the reach of memory, record, or tradition, and definitely ancient, ancient beyond memory or record. And so these are the off-reservation rights that were subject to that kind of the provision in the, in the original treaty that I mentioned. And two things to note about this, the Aboriginal rights, uh, you know, almost by definition, because of the time immemorial claim, or by definition, have uh, an earlier priority date. Than, the, than, than all other claims in all other water rights in Montana because of the time immemorial date. Um, and something similar has actually occurred, although it's been more disputed with the federally reserved rights. Given that the, tri the Flathead Reservation was not open to homesteading by, by non-tribal members until 1909, the tribe has argued that their on-reservation rights are necessarily superior or senior, sorry, to all other on-reservation rega rights, regardless of whether they're Aboriginal or reserved. Uh, but this fact, uh, which has come to be accepted, was not accepted at the time um, by many non-tribal residents of the reservation, um, especially ranchers and other kind of large irrigators, as well as a, lot, a number of municipal governments and Republican state legislators who argued that this 
const somehow constituted an unconstitutional taking, taking under the US Constitution, under the Montana Constitution. It's not worth getting into it, but just to say that there, there wasn't agreement at the beginning that was the fact. Legislation that I just discussed set up the, compact, the Montana State Compact Commission. Um, and the Compact Commission is a nine member commission appointed to four year terms uh, kind of in this makeup. And it created this really complex process for getting a, 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 an agreement negotiated. First there were negotiations and then the full commission once to beat upon had to vote upon the negotiations. Then it had to go to the Montana State Legislature who had to ratify it. Uh, then the tribal compact, so on the left hand column now, uh, then it had to go to the U.S. Congress, and Congress, uh, both the, the Senate and the House, had to ratify it. Uh, the president had to sign it. The tribe then had to vote to approve it, and then, and then, and it then needs a kind of pro forma approval um, by the Montana Water Court, uh, who issues the final decree, entering the rights agreed upon into the system that the state now manages uh, according to the 1973 Constitution. So it needs, there's a huge number of parties who have to sign on to this. Um, and at every step of the way, there have been roadblocks and, and issues and renegotiations as a result of the complexity of this process and just how many parties were a part. So there are a couple of other contextual things that I wanna bring up because I think they're important to kind of understanding the contentiousness of the conversations around the uh, compact. Three court cases that I'm not trying to pronounce it, Chioti, one, two, and three, I guess. Um, there were three court cases that were fought between 1996 and 2003 um, and argued before the Supreme Court. Um, and actually the last one was only, yeah, only found kind of during the actual negotiations. Uh, it was when the Supreme Court made its ruling. And it recognized the distinction um, between state appropriative water rights and reserve water rights. And the ruling was that new and amended water use permits on the reservation had to show that their proposed uses would not, quote, unreasonably interfere with a planned use for which water has already been reserved. And what the Supreme Court said again and again, um, as this case was refought in different forms, actually, uh, in, in only the first one was actually called Jyoti, as it was fought in different forms, what they argued was that because the state and because private non-tribal water users couldn't show proof that the uh, that their claims were not unreasonably interfering with the planned use, then that burden could not be met. And so a new water use permit could not be issued. Um, and so this decision uh, had a few significant impacts. It gave the tribes, the CSKT, a significant amount of bargaining power because municipalities and non-Indian reservations of the, on the Flathand Reservation uh, couldn't apply to the state for new or amended beneficial use permits so long as the tribe's reserved rights remained unquantified. And uh, the potential negative impact of the states uh, on the state of having to litigate each of the claims separately, each of the tribal claims separately was ramified. It's also important to note because that non-Indian permit holders were frightened of not receiving sufficient water for their own uses or losing their water rights altogether uh, because of the possibility of the tribes having, having reserved claims. And this generated political panic among kind of non-Indian municipal and county politicians and amongst uh, other uh, irrigators in the region. In 1982, uh, the tribes in coordination, oh, in anticipation of negotiations with the Compact Commission, collaborated with the US Geological Survey on a, an extensive drainage by drainage measurement program of groundwater, surface water, stream flow, river flow, uh, minimum fill levels of, of different bodies of water. Um, and so by the time the negotiations started in 2000, the US government and the tribes were in possession of unprecedented amount of data about the, uh, the water that was up for review. I got to interview a longtime tribal attorney who started his career in the early eighties and retired last year. So his, 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 his career uh, was bookended basically by this negotiation. And what he said was that fact finding was a, a process of sharing data with the state to bring the state up to speed. And it's something that I think as, was interesting about the negotiations is that opposition, especially from legislators over the course of negotiations was often ignorance because uh, the, just the knowledge was so one-sided at the start of negotiations. Finally, it's important to note that uh, the alternative to negotiations loomed over, over the, over the uh, negotiations. 
the tribes of the state, uh, if they did not uh, agree to a compact, the two sides would be forced to litigate each claim separately in the water court. That would have been very costly and taken many years. Uh, and there was a valid fear on the part of the non-tribal water users that they would be at risk of losing their state appropriated water rights be because of the tribe's uh, earlier priority dates. Even the tribes recognized that having to litigate their claims would be costly and burdensome. And it, just to give you a sense, these are just the off reservation claims that you see here. Uh, the left are 97 rights that as of 2018, it changed a little bit after that, but as of 2018, the tribe was gonna, rate, was gonna um, maintain um, off reservation. Uh, and these are the rights that the tribe, uh, uh, that the state thought the tribe had uh, the ability to adjudicate if they didn't have a compact. And so the tribe, if, if a compact wasn't reached, the tribe would, could have gone to court and litigated upwards of 10,000 different water claims across Western Montana. And as a result, there was a lot of incentive for the state to come to a settlement that both, both quantified the tribe's rights and also protected the junior rights of non-tribal water users so that this, so that this uh, you know, didn't occur and there wasn't decades of litigation over these rights. So in terms of kind of uh, the negotiation topics as I've already kind of discussed, um, there were on-reservation rights pertaining to the irrigation project, on-reservation rights pertaining to the irrigation deliveries. So this is uh, water from the irrigation project that uh, has historically been used by, by non-tribal water users. Um, and so uh, their right to continue to receive that water. There was uh, water from the Flathead system, meaning the Flathead River, um, its tributaries, uh, and the Flathead Lake. Um, and then there were a number of non-consumptive rights. Uh, off reservation, there, are, there were in-stream flow rights, as well as state law-based non-irrigation rights, which I'll talk about a little more later. Um, actually, one thing that I didn't put here is the other thing that was obviously a part of this was off reservation rights claimed by non-tribal users, uh, which is most, you know, most rights, off reservation rights that were at risk as a result of this were, were by non-tribal users. And somehow I didn't put that on here. Um, and then there was implementation. And so these were the discussions. I'm gonna put a, a kind of calendar in front of you and I don't need you to read through all of it. Um, this is one of the first of two pages because I really wanna call your attention to a couple of things. So the first thing is the start date. The first negotiation sessions occurred in 2000. Um, but in 2001, uh, the state issued, and this is after all three of those, you know, Choti one and two were done and, and the Choti three was currently before the Supreme Court. And despite that, the state issued yet another on-reservation permit during negotiations, uh, despite multiple rulings by the Supreme Court. Um, and I think it's important just because it, it shows to an extent the level of distrust and, and, and also the level of skepticism that, uh, that the tribe had about the state's uh, ability to and willingness to negotiate uh, forthrightly. I think it's also important that the facilitator who was brought in 2011, uh, Edward Sheets, I, I was told, and I've, I've been trying to get in touch with him, and I, I haven't been able to, but I was told that relatively little had been decided by the time he began working on the negotiations. Um, and he brought order to the negotiations and served as an unbiased party uh, with which both sides could discuss. Um, and I think the, the impact of, of him as a neutral party is really important. Um, I think also just the, the number of years that passed uh, between 2002 and 2005, the two sides turned their attention entirely to negotiating an interim agreement once they realized how long it would take to come to a final agreement. And then because of a number of, uh, for a number of political reasons, they abandoned the interim agreement. When the compact failed in the state legislature in 2013, because uh, that's what occurred. The first compact was agreed to, it went to the state legislature, it failed. Um, and much of the opposition at the time was Republican representatives expressing concern that the compact didn't uh, sufficiently protect non-tribal water users. And some of it was legitimate concern, although some of it appears to have been political grandstanding. Uh, then the state and the tribes agreed to, to a limited reopening. Uh, two years later, when, this when the uh, legislature uh, meets again, they pass it. Um, and then it went to the US Congress where it sat for five years in different forms with slight, a slight amendments occurring all over the place until finally it passed as a part of the COVID-19 stimulus bill in December. Um, and just days after that, um, uh, the tribe 
council passed it and now it's it's awaiting a, a bureaucratic review that is expected to be uh, simple, routine. Uh, I was told by, uh, by John Carter, the former staff attorney for the tribes, that one thing that helped the revised agreement pass two years later was extensive dialogue with a couple of key Republicans who were willing to learn more about the agreement, but whose opposition in 2013 faded by 2015 once they understood the thing better. So that's, I think, something that um, I will return to at the end, uh, but just the importance of that, of understanding. Um, so this is where they ended up. Um, on reservation rights were protected in a number of ways. The tribes agreed to with 211 total on reservation rights, really detailed. I didn't get into the detail here in terms of how it's apportioned, where it comes from, where it goes. Uh, with a priority date of 1855, they then agreed to relinquish the right to call all other on-reservation rights. The state agreed to give the tribes ownership of the, uh, or to the U.S. ownership and trust of the tribe of the irrigation project, uh, provided that the tribe continue to uh, deliver a certain quantity of water to non-tribal water users, non-tribal irrigators who have historically used the um, irrigation project. And that was a really contentious part of the agreement because a number of the non-tribal users uh, wanted the state to retain ownership. Then there were a number of non-consumptive rights. Yeah, so one quote, I'll, I'll skip a little bit, but one quote I want to say, this is a quote from a, a big timber a rancher named Lawrence Grosfield, who formed a group to help support the 2015 version of the compact, the revised version of the compact. She gave this in 2015. And she said, there, uh, Oh, he gave this, sorry, Lawrence. Uh, there wasn't much in the way two years ago of an educational effort for the press or legislators or anybody. We're going to be out and visible and just trying to spread accurate information about the compact and the whole process. And the, that two years later after the first agreement failed, that that educational process was really important. Off reservation, uh, the tribes retained uh, eight off reservation in stream flow rights, as well as 58 additional rights uh, to be co-owned by the, by the state and the tribes um, with very detailed parameters. The tribes agreed to relinquish 97%, many thousands of, of claims, protecting then non-tribal users across Western Montana. Uh, and that was hugely important. I, I want to point out one thing, which is that the map I showed you earlier of the off-reservation claims, it said on the map that there were 97 off-reservation rights in, in 2018 that the tribe were getting. But by the time the actual agreement uh, was passed by the U.S. Congress, that number had dropped to 58. Um, and that occurred because Senator Daines of Montana, uh, basically with the tribes, uh, negotiated slight changes in order to get other senators on board, other U.S. senators on board. So it's interesting that even once the, agree the agreement had passed, you know, was agreed to by the two sides, even once the state legislature had agreed to it, four years later, when it was with the U.S. Congress, they were continuing to negotiate over minor points so that th they could get this thing passed once and for all and uh, quantify the tribe's rights. Implementation. The tribes, so at the very beginning, the tribes wanted a unitary system that they controlled on reservation. Um, over time, they came to, to an agreement for a unitary system that was jointly controlled. Uh, and this was unprecedented for, for the state and uh, who, who had never given up some management to one of the tribes in the state and also was a significant concession by the tribes. This joint board is currently being set up with help from the state commission. Um, and the state agreed also to give $50 million to a number of water measurement and irrigation efforts. The unitary system is, is uh, something that a lot of the, uh, also again, the, the non-tribal irrigators were very upset about because they felt that they would lose the ability to negotiate rights uh, that they, that they felt they didn't should not have to go to the tribe for. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, a couple of conclusions that I want to bring up. One is that divergent knowledge is an impediment early on negotiations that you know water measurement should be jointly undertaken or jointly observed. I think it's really interesting that that one of the major uh, impediments in the, in the first years was simply the fact that the state didn't have anything close to the level of understanding of the, of the existing water on the reservation that the tribes had and that the US government had. Uh, second, that impartial facilitators are essential and should be utilized even before negotiations begin. Um, that the first decade, you know, wasn't wasted. A lot, some was, stuff was decided upon, but um, by all accounts, when Edward Sheets was brought on 
things moved forward much more smoothly in, in a really ordered fashion and with a lot less chest beating. Uh, and third, so when politics are bound to get in the way of an agreement's approval, um, it's better to include skeptical parties than to build wall around negotiators. Um, and this is just a personal thing. I think that um, certain state representatives and senators, as well as some major irrigators, might have been, uh, if they had been educated on the negotiations prior to the document's public release, it's possible, I don't know if this is for certain, but it's possible that uh, some of their resistance could have been mitigated. And then again, adaptive, which we talked about before this class, adaptive governance necessitates shared control. Finally, I didn't know what to do with this. It's one question I've been grappling with in the past days as I've been editing my doc, my, like, my written report, um, which is what should we, basically what should we make of the fact that even after the CSKT, after the tribes had negotiated with everybody in good faith, they had to give up additional rights um, in order to get it passed by the US Congress. Is there another system given the complexity of the process, another system that, that could have been set up to help create a process that, that wouldn't have required as much legal approval? Or is that simply a fact of, of history and we need to accept it? Um, and I'm just, it's a question I'm interested in. And with that, I will open it up for comments and questions. And I know that was a lot, so thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, um, Aaron, for the nice presentation. So um, now I, I would like to ask um, Hasnain to make comments and feedback. Uh, very well done, Aaron, with your presentation. Uh, you really picked a very complicated uh, case study because it involves very uh, a lot of stakeholders. Uh, so as, uh, as it involves a lot of stakeholders, so my first question would be, how do you think that all stakeholders came into one page? Um, and why do you think, why do you think this treaty, this, this, this uh, um, uh, treaty uh, took so much time uh, to you know, finally conclude uh, because it involved a lot of litigation uh, what was the things which were not going in the right direction before? And what was the thing which uh, happened this time to make it in the right direction? In terms of why it took so long, there are a couple of things. Um, when the Water Commission was created, when the Compact Commission was created in, in, in the late 70s, uh, you know, they had about, about a little over a dozen uh, thing, you know, agreements to negotiate with the federal government and with the state's tribes. And they decide, they purposefully did all of the others and then did uh, and then did the Flathead Reservation one because the Flathead Reservation one was the most complicated. And I think that actually, um, that actually wasn't a good thing. I think that there was a lot of, a lot of study and animosity um, and kind of divergence that, that occurred in those, in those intervening decades. In part, I think because uh, the tribes saw what was coming out of these other agreements and immediately began formulating alternate things, alternate ideas, because they didn't like what the other agreements were saying. And so a lot of a lot more could have been done, uh, a lot more could have been done earlier, I think, if discussions had started in the early 80s, for example, or the mid 80s. Um, I think the other things that that uh, impeded uh, the timeline, first is that because partially because of that, the tribes came into the negotiations with a lot of preconceived notions about what the uh, Kind of what the final agreement should look like, and th there were a lot of news reports, for example, after their first after the, their first formal negotiation session of all of these things that the tribes said that they wanted in the final agreement that the states immediately threw up their hands and said absolutely not. And negotiations actually shut down for a year at that point. Um, and so, and and so, if if those conversations could have started in the '80s when the tribes were beginning their process of of studying the the water quantity and the water quality, and if um, if that you know the the questions regarding the implementation could have been ongoing, I think a lot of a lot of anger and uh, you know could have been mitigated. So a part of it was 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 just uh, there was so much there was so much confrontation going into the agreement and very little trust. And so you and and the other thing I think that. I think took a lot. The second thing I want to say is that I think that uh, the role of the negotiator was really important. Without the negotiator, uh, a lot of you know, a lot of the opportunity for building trust didn't didn't occur, um, and it became uh, you know they became venting sessions, the negotiations, um, and and it wasn't always a productive thing. Um, so that's the question in terms of in terms of what went wrong, what took so long. I think the negotiator helped a lot, and then I think. 
eventually having, I mean, I, and this is where I think the water diplomacy framework does come to bear significantly, which is that I think once, once the two sides did have a shared understanding of, of the quantity of water in all the different locations and of the various, of the, you know, various legal arguments and of the potential uses, uh, once there was that shared understanding, it was a lot easier to come to agreements because they understood from what you know, point they were, uh, they were uh, compromising from. Um, whereas the tribes went into it with a lot more understanding and, uh, and were, you know, put up a very hard wall to begin with. And so having that shared understanding was, was really important. Sorry, I, I think I rambled on a little bit there, but I hope I got to your, your questions. Yes. So, yes, uh, yes. Hassan, uh, do you have further specific question? Because, yeah, one more. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it is related to the, the water diplomacy win-win framework. Uh, how do you think both parties uh, uh, agreed on this in a, on win-win side? For example, I I read somewhere on the uh, on I was doing some research on UPS study, and I said that I read that the tribes were allocated the national bison range, which I think somehow uh, was uh, uh, an attractive thing for them for agreeing into this treaty. There's a secondary note with this question is, uh, you mentioned in one of your slides that the number of uh, non-tribes is kind of more than the, num the, the actual tribal area, uh, tribal people. So given the, the I, I just want to understand from you what is the percentage of tribal people there and non-tribal people? And how do you think that that balances or evens out the whole treaty and things in the Montana region. Yeah. So so just to clarify, the National Bison Range is on the Flathead Reservation. Um, so uh, so the uh, the tribes were given uh, the kind of the manage rights over the management of that range, uh, but it was already on the reservation. It wasn't it wasn't something off reservation that they were fighting over. It was on reservation land that was, uh, you know, uh, under the legal authority of the tribes, but managed in trust by the federal government until until this occurred. Um, in terms of the, sorry, what was your question about the about the kind of uh, the numbers of uh, of, of non-tribal members? Yeah, I, I wanted to know that uh, uh, in this in this whole uh, Montana region, which we just with uh, in which the treaty is uh, enforced. Um, the what is the percentage of the, the tribal people are there and, and the non-tribal people like oh. how much benefit are they going to get the non-tribal people so i can't remember the, the population of the tribe i don't remember right now i believe i believe it's about eight thousand, and about 60 percent of the members live on the reservation so i believe it's it's i don't know the tribal members maybe it's five thousand. i can't i can't remember exactly right now how many tribal members live on the reservation um uh it's it's a few times that uh, in non-tribal members. It's not. I'm not sure the exact numbers again of non-tribal members of all the reservation, but it's it's a few times that the town of Polson, which is the biggest town on the reservation, has a, a population of about three and a half thousand. And there are many other small towns. Um, so those they were those rights. Uh, the tribes were given a you know the, this agreement quantified. Just to clarify, because maybe I didn't make this clear before. This agreement quantified the tribe's rights on the reservation, but then there's still other water. So that other water then, because the tribe's rights are quantified, can now be claimed by non-tribal users on the reservation, if that makes sense. Um, with, regards to the, with regards to the irrigation project, the irrigation project included a number of delivery schedules. And those delivery schedules uh, were, were specifically to provide water to uh, non-tribal irrigators who have historically used that water. Um, and there was a lot of disagreement about that. Those irrigators, many of them uh, you know, argued that the, the amount of water they were being allocated was insufficient and they were gonna have to move their lands. Um, and the state, of actually, the state of Montana agreed to actually uh, support them by helping to invest in kind of you know, uh, uh, drip agriculture and other things. Um, but uh, it, it, it will protect over the long term their rights, the non-tribal rights on the reservation, but uh, the one limitation is that the tribal rights, which are quantified now, have priority. I, I took this in question to refer to proportionality. If you look at the overall benefits that are allocated to the 
federal government, the state government, the tribe and non-tribal members living on the reservation. Yeah. Does the final agreement reflect uh, some kind of proportionality, equal proportion of gain, however measured? Did, did everybody come out roughly the same relative to the gains that they got, not in terms of how many people, but just in terms of these different categories? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I think in terms, so in terms of the number of people, I really, I, I don't know. In terms of the categories, um, the non-irrigators on the reservation, yes. Uh, so non-irrigators meaning not the irrigation project users, not uh, the non-irrigators definitely did. The, the, the municipalities um, were a portion, uh, are gonna have sufficient water to, to grow, uh, you know, homeowners and, and developers can build again for, for, for both reservation and non-reservation, not travel and non-travel members. There's significant amount of, of enough water and now enough legal clarity that that was a gain in itself. The, 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 the group um, you know, off reservation as well, I think that uh, a lot of the off reservation, definitely the, uh, the non-tribal members, non -tribal of the citizens of the state uh, gained a lot uh, because the tribe of Ant, you know gave up a lot of their claims. The one area where I think there's still disagreement on, and I don't have a, I, th I, I think that it's still very controversial um, and it will be throughout implementation, is on reservation irrigators. I think are one group that's that still a number of whom still feel like they did not um, have sufficient, they did not gain sufficient protection um, by uh, as a result of the negotiations. Good, that's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Kassiana, do, do you have any feedback or question yeah. to Aaron? Yes, I I'll be very quickly. Uh, first, Aaron, congratulations for your case. Very well. Very well done, very well, it's a complex case study. Um, I just wanna highlight some points here. I appreciate the historic context that you gave from 18, 1855 and to 2000. Also, I learned, I, le I like to learn a lot about the first in time, first in right that you mentioned before the 1973. And you, you mentioned that uh, the facilitator arrived in the negotiation only in 2011. But even with the facilitator, it took like nine years to reach the agreement. Uh, so to clarify, it, it took, it actually took, so the facilitator arrived in 2011, they reached their first agreement in 2013. Okay. So, so that was when they reached the agreement. Um, then as a result, the, uh, as a result of the state legislature voting it down, they renegotiated the agreement uh, for 20, in 2015. Uh, and at that point, and at that point, it was just sitting in Congress. So the so they weren't negotiating anymore. There were some minor things that were changed, but uh, and the facilitator is actually still involved. But but it actually only took two years with him to reach that agreement. Oh, two years. Oh, great. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, Aaron, you don't have to do here because I know Gemma has to present the Columbia, the Columbia uh, presentation. But if you can describe more in your in your paper the negotiation process with yeah. the compact commission. I like a lot that uh, this slide you, you put over there with the nine members. And if you can compare with the water management board that's only have five members, right? Yeah. Six members, only, but only five can vote. It's yeah. the only, I really appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. I um, in trying to understand the negotiation process has been really tricky. I like, I, yes. I've heard, I've read, and I, I've heard that there are, uh, that there are transcripts of the negotiations out there, uh, but I've actually called. I've called around. I've called like the the DNRC and and a number of other people who have party to them, and I've emailed people who have mentioned them, who have cited them, and I can't find them. Um, uh, I have a number. I have a lot of the. Uh, I have a lot of the. Uh, the what's it called? The um, uh, topic know. lists. The topic right. lists, but not the. Uh, but not the transcripts themselves, which is a disappointment. Uh, so, any any other um, question or comments from Flora or Gemma? Okay, thank you all. I appreciate your feedback. Um, yes. Yeah, so maybe before uh, Larry, I, I would like to ask uh, one thing. Um, so, how how does um, a national politics play a role? Um, because I learned that the comparison, uh, the the state 
uh, a legislator, specifically the Republican legislator is um, was not in favor of this auto right issue and and uh, there are some issue between um, with uh, within the re Republican and there are some conflicts. So how d does it um, how does it play a role in the negotiation process um, in this treaty? I defy anybody to explain that. Anybody, I don't care who they are, because there's what the system is designed to do, and there's what the system, the political system, actually does. And what it actually does is a function of who has the majority and who's in leadership in the executive branch. And it doesn't matter what it says on paper about what is a state's right, what is a national government's right, what is executive, what is legislative, it doesn't matter. It all changes every time there's a shift in power and relationships. So um, there is no way to answer the question about what is this crazy intergovernmental system we have supposed to do relative to Indian rights, because you then also have the, the court entering. We have these three branches and the Supreme Court got involved in this case at one stage, as you heard from, from Aaron, and you have the state legislature and you have the federal government legislate the Congress, but you also have the agencies and the agencies have responsibilities for the tribes, the interior department. Uh, it, is, it is an insanely complicated system and uh, it's very hard to know what's going on even when it's happening because it's not transparent and people make all kinds of private deals and other issues get traded off against the issue you're interested in. And you don't even know that that's why somebody voted a certain way. They're not, they didn't care about the issue, but they got something from somebody else for something else. So unraveling all of that, I mean, I think Aaron did a, a wonderful job as best you can do of at least getting a timeline and looking at the outcomes. But the process, I mean, even with the transcript, it, it, it's indecipherable and everything related to Native Americans in the United States doesn't go the way the law says it's supposed to. Every treaty has been broken, continues to be broken. Every promise, everything that the US government promised and committed to, none of it's been upheld. And so, yeah, I can point to what the system says. And somebody can hold up a treaty and say, look, here, you, I'm guaranteed certain rights. Yeah, well, try to get it enforced. So uh, it's the complexity of the US intergovernmental system uh, and the extent to which it's really not transparent what's happening, uh, make it impossible to answer your question. Thanks. Uh, so maybe for the final paper, I would like to ask, but because this is one of the treaty that is successful recently in terms of water treaty. So maybe uh, you can share very specific lesson learned from the negotiation process. I think that would be much more uh, helpful in terms of water diplomacy aspect. I think as this is very new uh, kind of treaty that is successful and how the process works and what are the general uh, general uh, lesson learned. I think that would be much more interesting things. I really liked the four concluding points that you had. I think those were um, very um, strong. And as, as long as in the text, you will give your, you elaborate on them slightly, but as four concluding points in terms yeah. of what can be learned from this case, I think they're terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.